When Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As many came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these uh, should, be, should not be baptized, who have just received the Holy Spirit, just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> then they asked to stay, for him to stay a few more days. Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, You went in to uncircumcised men and ate with them. But Peter explained explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city in Joppa praying and uh, in a trance, and I saw a vision, an object descending like a great sheet let down from heaven by four corners, and it came to me. When I was observing it intently and considered, I saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air, and I heard a voice saying to me, Rise, Peter, kill, and eat. But I said, No, not so, Lord. For nothing common or unclean has ever at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God has cleansed you shall not call common. Now this was done three times, and all uh, were drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men stood before me in the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, And we entered the man's house, and he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who told him to send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you the words by which you have, by which you and your household will be saved. And as and again, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as the Lord had on us in the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, "John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized." With the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as He gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God, saying, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. And Lord, we thank you for repentance to life for the Gentiles, as uh, we are the recipients and the beneficiaries of, res- of, of eternal life as Gentiles, in in, uh, your Son, Jesus, our Lord and Savior. We thank you for that, Lord, that we can be grafted in, those of us who are a wild branch, some more wild than others, grafted into the natural branch, Lord, of uh, the promises, of the covenants that you've promised beforehand. And Lord, we now, because of it, have every confidence in your ability to save and your promise to save, and all we need to do is trust you in faith, with our salvation, confessing our sins and trusting in you, giving our lives to you, uh, serving you as though you are our Lord because that's what you desire to be. And with our best interest in mind, you, you rule over us in a loving and respectful and amazing way that we don't deserve. So we thank you, Lord. We ask that this word this evening uh, fill us, fill our hearts and our minds, direct us. We ask for your Spirit's gifts to come upon us in every way as we're going to talk about those. Uh, ultimately that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So again, chapter 10, verse 44, Peter was still speaking these words, and the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed, they were blown away. That's the translation of the word astonished, blown away, okay? Uh, As many came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak in tongues and magnify God, and then Peter answered. Now, before Peter answers, the, quote, gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, in, in um, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter um, 12 is where we see the list of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, there it just it doesn't say gift. It just says spirituals, which is interesting because it identifies the source as being the Spirit of God. But here it specifically says um, that this, there is a gift of the Holy Spirit. So uh, the, the idea of it being a gift is added here in Acts uh, 10. Uh, so that's why we call them, even though it doesn't say that in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, it does say it here. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. They received it. 
Uh, and then we see that the, the, really the, the gifts from the Holy Spirit appear in three different places in the New Testament, lists of individual or specific gifts. We have Romans 12. Now, we're not going to get into detailed message on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I've done topical messages on that before. If you want to study that, I encourage you to get those messages uh, from the archives and listen to them. Um, they've, in my studies and pre- preparations of those things, they, they always benefit and bless me when I go back through them again, just because I'm reminded of the, the, our dependence on God in them. But if you look at the three different places, you have Romans chapter 12 uh, is, the, is the first place they appear in order. Um, and and uh, that is what we, we like to refer to those as motivational gifts, because those gifts have very practical results when they're exercised. And it says also there, as it does in each of these places, that the intent or purpose of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is for the edification of the body of Christ. It's never for someone's soul gratification, satisfaction, or glorification. That is, a gift of the Spirit is not about me. It's about God putting something in me for the benefit of the body of Christ. That's what a gift of the Spirit is for. It's for Jesus' body. And so every gift has to fit that. Now, the motivational gifts, that's very easy for us to agree with because we see there we have gifts of leadership, we have gifts of uh, teaching mercy, you know, those kinds of gifts, which are very practical in nature. And everyone's like, yeah, I'm good with that. That's fine. But then when we get to this list of gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the spirituals, um, people get all weirded out. And I understand why, because the, these gifts, these motive, or we call them then manifestational. So you have motivational. We like to call those motivational. Why? It just helps us categorize them and remember what, what, how they fit together. So we have the motivational in Romans 12. Then we have what we call the manifestational gifts or the spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so there you have gifts like tongues, prophecy, healing, and those kind of gifts. They're kind of the ones that everyone's afraid of, right? And now I, I must confess that my, my history in Christianity began in a nominal Christian, uh, nominal Catholic existence. Later on, a uh, very conservative Baptist uh, experience that I still am bearing fruit from in my life today. The emphasis on the teaching and trust of the Word of God and the authority of the Word of God all came from there, the, all the belief in those things. So I, credit, I credit that church and uh, that theology a lot for those things. By the same token, that particular church taught very boldly that the First Corinthians chapter 12 gifts were no longer in operation today. They believe that they, those gifts have ceased, and so hence the word cessation. So you'll hear those that come from a camp of cessational theology where certain gifts of the Spirit no longer exist. And what they do is they try to take uh, chapter 13 of First Corinthians, and they say, see where it says that when that which is perfect has come, that which is imperfect will be done away. And they make it about that. But honestly, I don't, I don't agree with that. I used to believe that. And, and, and I think where this teaching, in my opinion, it, it arose out of uh, movements of Christianity that abused these gifts and that, that sort of blamed the Holy Spirit for expressions of faith that were totally not of God at all. And so you have, uh, unfortunately, with, with human nature, we have what, what I like to refer to as the pendulum theory. So if something moves too far in an abusive way, in a wrong direction, where it's bearing bad fruit, the obvious re- response is to move the pendulum because it has so much momentum when you're bringing it back the other way. It doesn't stop at the center. It keeps going. And, and so teaching started to come out. Well, those gifts must not be for today because clearly those things are not from God. And so you have then this, this other teaching. That, that And I think the truth lies in the middle. I do believe that... The gifts do exist today. Why do I believe it? Because I don't believe the scriptures clearly teach that these gifts have ceased. I don't believe that. I don't believe you can find anywhere in scripture where you can conclusively say, oh yeah, that's, that's absolutely uh, what's, what's being taught. And, and to be honest with you, the 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 explanation is very, very weak in an argument, very weak. And so um, they, they try to make it about the canonization of the New Testament, and then from that, that, that's what's being talked about when that which is perfect has come. When, to me, there's no other clear explanation other than that which is perfect is Jesus, referring to 
when we're with Jesus in heaven, there's no need for these manifestational gifts anymore. They just won't be unnecessary. By, by the way, teaching will be unnecessary, uh, uh, although worship will not. So the worship leaders never get to retire, but the teachers do. So uh, I'm okay with that. Do me a favor, though. Turn to 1 Corinthians. Let's look at some of this. I want to look at chapter 14, because what's being brought up here uh, in uh, Acts 10 is tongue specifically, which is one of the most controversial. Do people abuse this? Absolutely. There's many churches out there today that call the gift of tongues, they practice what they call the gift of tongues, they practice tongues, and it's completely unbiblical. And therefore, they're just doing it in their flesh, or in worst case scenario, worst case scenario, and I don't see this really as happening often, but I think there are some people that are just being manipulated by demons, to be honest with you. And, and they're presenting a false faith. Now, um, again, there's the two extremes, so you, ha- you have to be careful on either side. There's Today, we recently had someone who I was a longtime hero of mine, of theology, a fellow by the name of John MacArthur. He recently kind of went off the deep end on this stuff. And he has now said anyone who believes in the gift of tongues or, or these manifestational gifts is of the false church. They're not even real, really part of Jesus' church anymore. And, and now, I wouldn't tell you this if I didn't actually watch the videotape and, and watch him say it. In fact, he names Calvary Chapel and says that Calvary Chapel is the one who's uh, at fault for causing um, the church to be uh, sort of, um, to, to uh, be, allow the, the community or, the, or the, the people to tell the church what to do, is what he literally said. So what is the gift of tongues? Well, we certainly know from Acts chapter 2 that the gift of tongues, very clearly in Acts chapter 2, is the ability just to say what you know what to say, and then yet people who don't even speak your language can understand it. And so we know that it is that. But the question is, is it only that? The answer to that question is, no, it is not only that. Otherwise, there'd be no need for a gift of interpretation. Because if the gift of tongues was simply for me to be able to speak the only language that I know how to speak in the presence of people that don't understand my language, and for them to understand it, well, they already, uh, I'm speaking it and they're understanding it. That's not the gift of interpretation biblically as defined. So it's not only that, but it's also that. So what also is it? Well, let me tell you one thing that it's not, and I'm going to prove it to you here in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians. It is not God speaking to the church. And this is one of those abuses that we often find in Pentecostal churches or churches uh, that fall on a hyper-Pentecostal expression of these gifts. Why is it not that? Well, because the Bible very clearly says, look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, pursue love, desire spiritual gifts. And let me stop you right there in in verse 1. Desire spiritual gifts. And we're also going to read in here, it literally says, do not forbid to speak in tongues. And here's what scares me, is if a church is believing that the gift of tongues has ceased, and therefore they say to people, you are not permitted to speak in tongues, and they're wrong about their belief in the gifts having ceased, then they're in direct disobedience to the Word of God in in not allowing people to speak in tongues. That's a scary place for me to be, and one one of my very convicting reasons why I don't forbid to speak in tongues, nor do I, uh, nor am I willing to run the risk of being in absolute direct disobedience. So because of these verses, so, so desire spiritual gifts. If you were raised like me to believe that the spiritual gifts were not of today, then you don't desire them. It's a scary thing for you. So there might be, and I'm sure there are people in here right now that came from that background. I know the Benellis did. Um, and I think, I mean, Jesse, you could speak for yourself, but I, I think probably you've opened your heart since you've started attending Calvary Chapels that you've softened your view on that, and your family has in a huge way. You've softened your view on that in a huge way. And maybe others have as well. So, um, and I just encourage you, whatever your view is, I'm fine with it. If you're a cessationist, you're welcome to worship with us here, you know? Just don't judge those who believe otherwise. That's all I ask. Anyway, desire spiritual gifts. Directly, Paul saying, by inspiration of the Spirit, you should desire them. So what does it mean to desire them? It means ask. Ask the Lord for spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. So prophecy is, um, it's, it's, a, it's manifested in two different ways. Prophecy is manifested in proclamation uh, and, and um, 
sort of a foreknowledge of future events. And it typically, when I've seen it used, it comes across as bringing clarity of righteousness to the circumstances. When someone prophesies, they're not telling the future like a crystal ball kind of thing, like a lot of people think, oh, that's Nostradamus. It's not that, okay? It is bringing clarity to the Word of God and giving us understanding that establishes righteousness in the body of Christ. It might be simply somebody speaking forth the truth of the Word of God, and it comes across with great authority all of a sudden that we know does not reside in that person. They don't, they're not an authoritative person. But yet what they say something, and wow, it comes across as being authoritative. Why? Because the gift of prophecy exists in them. So we see that often. But now what we're really after here is verse 2. He who speaks in a tongue, listen very clearly, does not speak to men but to God. A person who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but speaks to God. Um, For no one understands him. However, in the Spirit he speaks mysteries, but he who prophesies... Again, now going back to the subject of prophecy, speaks edification, which is a word that means a building up or a construction, and exhortation and comfort to men. So prophecy is very practical in the sense that people receive a great deal of comfort and strength from it. Verse 4, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Now note this, verse 5, I wish that you all spoke with tongues. So what does that mean to you? It means that not everybody speaks in tongues. And again, some of the churches that fall on that more liberal side of the gifts of the Spirit, they, some of them, in fact, many of the assemblies of God fall under under this category, not all of them, but they believe that if you don't speak in tongues, you're not saved. Uh, This verse here cancels that belief out, absolutely. So, I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied, for he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church might receive education. So what do we know? Well, we know that that one who speaks in a tongue speaks to God, speaks praise to God. Go all the way to the end of this section, verse 15. Let's start, we'll go to 14. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with understanding. Otherwise, uh, by the way, that's saying um, simply that, that um, not, to, not to forbid to speak in tongues, but we, I will pray that way, but I will also pray the other way. It's, so if you speak with tongues, that's not the only way to pray, verse 15 or verse 16. Otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uniform say amen, and that you're giving a thanks, for he does not understand what you say. For indeed you give thanks well... So this is where we get the idea you're giving thanks or praise to God, but the other is not edified. So what is it? It is speaking praise or thanksgiving to God, right? Verse 17, if indeed you, if you speak in an unknown tongue, uh, you give, you, you do well, you, you, uh, you give thanks well. I thank my God, I speak with tongues uh, more than you all, yet in church I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that I might teach others also than 10,000 words in a tongue. You see, the emphasis there, the Apostle Paul makes very clear, um, you know, what the emphasis is. It's on, the, it's on the proclamation of truth in church, and it's not that important to speak in tongues in the presence of others, you know. It goes on, if you continue on to study that on your, on, your, um, on your own later, you look at, it talks about, uh, in verse, verse 20 through 25, how uh, tongues can be a sign to unbelievers, uh, that that something is different that they're not familiar with. Um, so you might want to read that on your own if you want to study this a little further. But tongues clearly is uh, a, an unknown tongue, or it's referred to in Romans as an angelic language. And so we absolutely, in this church, we believe in the gift of tongues. And if you have the gift of tongues, I encourage you to use it. So we don't, we rarely, if ever, give you the opportunity or specifically ask you to, but we do not forbid it either. So where would you do it? Well, you do it in home groups, um, Wednesday nights. If someone spoke in a tongue here on a Wednesday night, I wouldn't stop them. However, if after a while there was no interpretation, I would ask that, okay, just as it goes on to say in chapter 14 of 1 Corinthians, let's not do that anymore because it's not benefiting anyone but the one speaking in the tongue. 
because they're using their gift. So we would withhold that. And I think any of you who have gone to this church for any length of time could, could testify to the fact that none of this stuff has ever gotten in the way of our worship of God. There have never been abuses of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, yet we believe in them and practice them in our own lives. Amen? Just, just for fun, raise your hand if you speak in tongues, if you have that gift. See Matt? Okay. I see Terry. Anybody else? Okay. So we have some people in here. So if you want to ask them what it's like for them and how, what it feels like or have them explain it to you, then, then I encourage you to do that. Um, if you don't know what your gifts are if, or if you've never prayed to ask the Lord for gifts, I encourage you to do that. In fact, if you would like to, this is biblical also, if you would like to pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit after the message tonight, I would be happy to pray over you for the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, and again, the understanding is that these gifts are for the edification of the body of Christ. You, all you need to do is read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and you'll see that we are, it says, all, it's emphasis on that we are one body in Christ, and that these gifts are for the edification of all. So what happens here is these Gentiles hear Peter testifying of the identity, person, and work of Christ, and they get moved by the Holy Spirit, they're drawn by the Father, they accept Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes upon them, they speak in tongues. It doesn't say that every one of them did, but it doesn't say that every one of them didn't, but we know that um, certainly they spoke in tongues. And now the immediate response by Peter is, well, hey, let's find some water and baptize them too, might as well. We see evidence, and what is that? That um, not that you're not supposed to be baptized until you speak in tongues. That's not what it's saying. What it's saying, though, is that we see now evidence that the Holy Spirit is in them. So now we know it's okay to baptize them. Why not do it? I mean, right after a person gets saved, let's, let's just take them down and, you know, and I just think, you know, this January, we should have been dragging people down to the ocean and dunking them. It would have, been, would have made sense to me, you know. So um, we should just keep the tank full on Sunday mornings, but... You know, have a trap door under the worship team. The, the singers up there, Donna and everyone up there. It's, uh, we have doors, by the way. There is a baptismal tank but on this, under the stage. If, if you, I don't know if you knew that or not. But um, you what? Well, not only Baptist churches have baptismals, but yeah, it is an old Baptist church. But yeah, absolutely. We have a baptismal tank, and we've used it since we've moved in. It's, we've used it only once because we love to do baptisms uh, at the ocean or at somebody's pool. We love to do that outside. But if anyone wants to get baptized, feels that the Lord is telling them to get baptized, certainly we will, we will go through the motions and get that thing heated up for you, although it depends on who you are as to how warm I make it. And we certainly will be happy to baptize you. So, can anyone forbid water that those should be baptized who have just received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Absolutely not. Let's go find a place and dunk them. Uh, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then they asked him to stay a few days. Uh, I think that's wonderful. And, and this is, again, Gentiles now, the, the revelation of the mystery that was hidden since the beginning of time was that the Gentiles would be mixed together as an as a uncommon people, mixed together with the Jews, and that, by the way, salvation would come by grace through faith, was all wrapped up. This whole mystery was a big package. Gentiles can get saved, it wasn't through the law that you get saved. All this stuff is a mystery. That, that God himself would be the one to come and save would be the Messiah. Verse uh, 1, chapter 11. And the apostles, of course, um, they were in Judea. They heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with Peter. Um, and again, I remind you of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 and 20, for a little clarification on what's going on here. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and far, far, uh, foreigners, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, but now fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So this is now both the Gentiles together with the Jews. The first 10 or so years of the church was all Jews predominantly or proselytites. So you have like the Cyrenian man and so on and so forth. These were proselytized into Judaism, then became Christians. But for the most part, you had to be Jewish 
in one way or another. But so here you have now the, one of the earliest known attacks on Christianity, and it's from within the church. It's pretty interesting. And I will say this about what this attack is all about, is it is about legalism. And if that's a word you're not familiar with, I know a lot of people struggle with uh, defining legalism. Because, uh, it, you know, you can't, you can't come away from a reading of the Scripture and, and not understand from the reading of Scripture that God wants us to be holy and that the law is good. It's righteous and true, and He wants us to be obedient to the law. Well, then you say to me, but that's works. Yes, it is, but it's not legalism. You see, the Bible doesn't say that good works are bad. In fact, the Bible encourages us to good works. Okay, the difference between legalism and good works that the Bible prescribes for us is that legalism in the heart of the person performing the works believes that they now have earned or deserved something from God. You can't do something in exchange for something else with God. It doesn't work that way. And so what then is good works uh, that is, in in the biblical sense, uh, a, a positive or a good thing or not wrong? Well, It is simply allowing God to use you to establish goodness in this world, righteousness and truth and love. The love of God established in other people's lives through you. That's good works. But it doesn't earn or deserve anything. Yes, God promises to reward you. He will do that. That's his delight to do it. He doesn't do it because you deserve it. He does it because he loves you. Wouldn't you rather be given something by someone who loves you just because they love you rather than because you've earned or deserved it? But it is the human nature a tendency to desire to feel as though there's some intrinsic value in us. We can't escape it. We're always trying to find worth or value in ourselves. I think that's what the, uh, I, you know, the vertical identity thing that they're doing up at Old Bridge, that little conference, that youth conference, is all about. You know, who are you? Uh, my Easter message this year, my Resurrection Sunday message was, who in the world do you think you are? I'm nobody. And I'm happy to be nobody. And I'm content with that now. Knowing how rotten I really am has made me quite content. Because I have no expectation of myself anymore. And I know if anything good comes from me, it's not me who's doing it. It's God using me. And that is so freeing. There's nothing more freeing than knowing you're nothing. I, I know it's good saying, right? Nothing more freeing than knowing you're nothing. Why? Because there's very little expectation upon yourself. We work so hard to try to be something, and we wear ourselves out. And God just says, just follow me. Take up your cross daily. Stop worrying about yourself, the self-life. Let me live my life through you, and good things will happen. Uh, My favorite phrase from my biblical theology teacher, he's since gone home to be with the Lord, uh, Bob Hoekstra, um, always used to say, righteousness is a relational reality. You don't set out in an effort to become righteous in your own flesh. It's not through human effort. It's through the affection and the time spent with Jesus, the affection for God and what he's done for you and the love of his word, your passion for God and your desire for him. That righteousness is instilled, endued upon you. God puts righteousness in you. The more time you spend with him, relationship, the more of his righteousness becomes your reality. Righteousness is a relational reality. You want to be more righteous? Spend more time with God. Don't set out to study the law in an effort to try to fulfill 613 commandments. I'm not saying not to study the law. It's good. It's holy. It's true. It's righteous. Jesus didn't come to to abolish it. He came to fulfill it. So why study the law with the intent to try to fulfill it when you can study the one who fulfilled it and try to Just love him, and he'll make himself uh, uh, abound in you. He and his righteousness will abound in you if you set your affection on his things. Amen? And I will say this, that nothing kills Christianity more than legalism. It is the biggest Christian killer. Christianity dies, suffers in a legalistic atmosphere. It just kills it. Nothing kills it more. I call it pull-up-your-bootstrap theology, you know? And I, I, I fell into this uh, very early on in, in my Christianity where uh, I allowed the words I was hearing, I won't blame people's sermons for it, but I allowed the words that they were saying to come across and believe in my heart. 
that once I got saved, God has wiped the slate clean. These are not my words. I've taken them from somebody else. And now it's up to me to go out and live and not get dirty. You know, I have to, and, and, and I, I've heard these verses quoted, set your face like a flint, right? You know that verse, right? I've heard it quoted in this context, like, don't, now, now it's up to you not to sin. How do you not sin? Set your face like a flint. Oh, it's up to me? Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I got to try harder. And then what happens is you try harder and you try harder and you fail and you fail and you try harder and you try harder and you try harder and you fail and you fail and you fail. Before you know it, you do one of you, you do several different things. One, you you compromise the true meaning and the nature of the law to where it's then attainable in your flesh. It's the only way you can reconcile your disobedience of the law is you start to redefine the law in a way that makes you feel like you're fulfilling it. I did that. I lived that way. But I knew, I just knew it wasn't right. And it wore me out in my 20s, you know, it was just horrible. Or, and the other thing you do is you say, well, you know, I'm, I'm forgiven. I'm not perfect. <laughs> you start to excuse yourself. That's just who I am. You, you know, that's, you got to accept me the way I am. Jesus accept me the way I am. And you start to accept yourself in your sin. You should never accept yourself in your sin, but you shouldn't be the one who try to makes yourself perf- tries to make yourself perfect either. Never be content with who you are. You should never say, I've arrived, I'm done. I'm no longer a work in progress, I'm there, I'm done. It's not about that. You're always a work in progress in Christ. He's Because al- you know why? He loves you too much to leave you alone. You know? And he wants to change us. And I'm a work in progress. We should all be a work in progress. Now, so we have it here in, the, in, ver- in chapter 11, the, um, this attack of legalistic thinking as those in Jerusalem are now contending with Peter because the, the law is somehow being offended by these Gentiles and Peter's eating with them. So we're going to see this. So again, I'll, I'll read verse 1. The apostles in, wow, that, that was a long introduction. It's, it's 10 to 9. I'm sorry. The apostles and brethren were in Judea and heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision, Jews by nature, contended with him, saying, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. This is uh, uh, not even in the law, by the way. This is, just, you, this is just inferred by the law. That was their interpretation of the law, that they were not to eat with them. It was eating, you must understand, was a very intimate thing. And if you ate with somebody you were being associated with who they were, and therefore you were associating yourself with who they were. So it was thought that Gentiles couldn't be saved, so you couldn't eat with a Gentile because you were being intimate or having an intimate relationship with someone who couldn't be saved, and that was the thinking. And, and now there, there are people, there are, um, there are sects of faith that think of themselves as Christian, uh, some more obvious than others, who live by this kind of stuff. We have the J-dubs, of course. We have the Mormons. Uh, and we have even, even mainline Christianity that expresses faith in Christ through legalism. And it kills faith. It kills faith. It is, you cannot live that way. Uh, and so this is, this is certainly uh, a death to a movement that, is, that can potentially happen. But now look what Peter does, verse 4. He explained it to them in order from the beginning, saying, and he recounts the events that we read about in the last chapter. I was in the city. I was in Joppa. I was praying. I was in a trance, meditating on the Lord. I saw a vision, object descending. It was a great sheet, let down from heaven, a bunch of unclean animals, uh, four-footed animals of earth, wild beasts, creeping things, birds of the air. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord. We love covering those three foolish words, for nothing common or unclean has at any time entered my mouth. But the voice answered again from heaven, saying, what God has cleansed you may, must not call uncommon. And this was the beautiful way that God revealed this new th- truth to Peter, was that the, the Gentiles would no longer be called common or unclean. God's saying, look, I know you've thought that way all along. God, isn't that, you ever think of that? God knew that Peter thought this way all along. And he's waited till now to start to work on this issue. We're talking about the church is well over 10 years old now, plus the three years Jesus, Peter walked with Jesus. You know? God is, he's so patient with us, you know? 
And he was so patient with, the, with all of us. And, he's, and I see it here. But now, here's what's interesting about this, is Peter defends himself and eating with the Gentiles would later on fail in this very thing. You'll read about it in Galatians. Let me quote it from you, Galatians. In fact, I'll read a bit of it uh, to you, a little bit more than I would have otherwise. It says this, Galatians 2.11. You could turn there if you like. We're going to go all the way to the 16. Um, Galatians 2, beginning 11. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, this was the church that uh, Paul planted, Paul speaking to the church in Galatia, he says, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. Paul saying, it was my job to correct Peter. You can't correct the Pope. What are you doing, Paul? Who do you think you are? That's the Papa, <laughs> you know? But no, he was to be blamed. Paul was saying, I was right in correcting him. And he goes on to say, verse 12, for before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But then when they came, certain men came. These are high maka maka, they say in Hawaii. These are like up there in Judaistic terms, you know. He then withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were, quote, of the circumcision, unquote. Natural born Jews. He wanted to not uh, be considered an outsider to them. He wanted to have fellowship with these of the circumcision guys. So he felt this pressure, peer pressure, if you will, to not be seen as eating with. So he turned his back on the Gentiles, those who he formerly would eat with, because these new guys came in. Now, you, you could sit here and, now this is rationalization. Let me give an example of rationalization. Well, I really want to reach these guys for Jesus. So if I just, you know, maybe just for a little time, just ignore the Gentiles and not eat with them, I can reach these guys for the gospel. And you see how you might think that way? But Paul's saying, no, that's wrong. You don't compromise loving the body of Christ to try to win someone. And, and you need to show them, you need to love them too, but you also need to show them that they're, they're wrong about the Gentiles. And how do you do that? By showing no partiality and continuing in your practice of eating with and loving the unlovely. Verse 13, and the rest of the Jews, we're still in Galatians there, the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas was carried away in their hypocrisy. Ooh, Barnabas, maybe you didn't realize that. Barnabas was caught up in this too. Paul had to correct a whole bunch of people. But when I saw that they were not straightforward, they were sort of being deceptive and stepping around the issue about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of everybody, before them all, if you being a Jew live in a manner of Gentiles and not as a Jew, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, now this is the issue, but by faith in Jesus Christ and elsewhere, he says, alone. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ. We're getting saved the same way they are, so who are we to set ourselves apart? Not by works of the law, for by the works of the law, very little flesh. What? Wait, what? Did I get that wrong? No flesh, no flesh shall be justified. That's what legalism is. By works of the law, attempting to justify yourself. I'm, I'm just because I'm good. No. You know people think this way. Will you go to heaven when you die? Well, I think so. Well, why? Well, I'm a pretty good person. No, then you're not going. It's that simple, you know? And we're taught this stuff, and it's very human, and it's very, honestly, it's very natural to think that way. And you want to know why it's so natural to think that way? Because we know very clearly, in, intuitively, we don't even have to be taught it, that sin keeps us from heaven. So righteous acts then gets us there, right? It just, it's just a natural next thought. Now, in one sense, it's true. Does righteous acts get us to heaven? Yes, just not ours. <laughs> Jesus' righteous acts get us to heaven, not our own. So in one sense, it's true. Yes, righteous acts get us to heaven. We just can't do any. None are good, no, not one. 
all of us are like filthy rags, you know? We've all gone astray, dead works. Anyway, verse 10. Uh, we're back in now um, Acts chapter 11. Now this was done three times. As he's recounting what happened, the sheet came down three times because I needed to see it three times because I'm that thick-headed. Anyway, verse 11. And that very moment, three men stood before the house where I was, having been sent to me from Caesarea. Then the Spirit told me to go with them, doubting nothing. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered the man's house, and he told us how he had seen an angel standing in his house who said to him, send men to Joppa in order to retrieve Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you the words by which you and all your household will be saved again. We know that even though um, the word God fear, those who feared God is used in this passage, the same phrase, uh, they were not saved yet. They're still reaching out. Phobamonos ton theon, those who feared God. Um, and verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as in the same way as us, as in the beginning. As he remembers now back to 10 years ago in the upper room when the Holy Spirit fell on them, uh, just as it happened to us. One of the greatest abuses of the gifts of the Spirit throughout the charismatic movement is that they practice non-biblical fleshly substitution of true tongues, and that has confused this issue so badly. But again, I've, as I've reminded you in 1 Corinthians 14, um, we put them into the correct uh, perspective, verse 16. <clears throat> Let's see, where will we end tonight? We will end with verse 18, 16. Then I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I, could, that I should or could withstand God. Now, this is a stark contrast, in my opinion, to the words, not so, Lord. It's okay, Lord, if you say so. They received the Holy Spirit in the same way we did. Amen. I'm for it. Who am I to withstand God? And that is the great thing that we can, we can yield our hearts, yield our lives. When we see God has approved of something, who are we to say no? Verse 18. When they heard these things, and this is them now yielding to Peter's testimony, we'll close with this, they became silent, and in doing so glorified God, saying, then God has granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. And that is our great promise and hope, is that God has granted to the Gentiles, and this is the moment that they, silent before God, why is that glorifying to God? Because they're simply agreeing with God. It brings God glory for them to change their hearts and minds and no longer reject that which they formerly rejected, which God has called holy. Amen?